Hello, this is National Master Spencer Feingold back at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta with part five of our discussion on unorthodox Sicilians. This time I'm going to flip the script a little bit. Yeah, a little bit of a little bit of a script flipping, I like to call it. <laughs> Where uh, usually, you know, if you were with us for parts one through four, you'll notice that every time it was an unorthodox Sicilian, that it was actually... Uh, it was actually White playing the unusual move and bringing us to an unorthodox position. This time, however, it's going to be Black playing an unusual move, and uh, that move is going to be 2a6. Yes, it's called the O'Kelly variation of the Sicilian defense, and we're going to be looking at specifically games where Taimanov, Mark Taimanov, played uh, as Black. And... Uh, so yeah, it's, it's going to be a little different than the other ones, because in the other, like I mentioned, the other ones, it was white making an unusual move. But of all the un unorthodox Sicilians that I've analyzed so far for this series, all five, including this one, I would say that this is the one I'd recommend the most. Like, I would say that black should play this before white should play the other unorthodox Sicilians. Not that those are bad, but um, it's pretty... There's pre it's pretty low risk, actually, to play the O'Kelly variation. In fact, I had a list of some uh, benefits and, and downsides to playing the O'Kelly, so why don't I just uh, talk about that for a second. Well, th the benefit for playing the O'Kelly is very similar to the benefits of the other uh, unorthodox Sicilians we've talked about so far, is that you're in so much control of the opening, from move two, even. From move two, you have control of, like, we're playing the O'Kelly, and that's, that's what we're doing. You know, you have, white has to play an unusual move on move two, like two knight a3 from Shabalov or something, in order to avoid it. Most of the time, people play knight f3 on move two. So you've got a lot of control, um, and you can play the opening that you want almost all the time. And it's not even very anti-positional. Playing a6 in a Sicilian, that happens in most Sicilians. You know, just to name a few, like a knight orf, or a Shvenigan, a Khan, you know, Paulson, Taimanov, you know, it's just, it's kind of funny because we're looking at Taimanov games, but uh, also even like a Shveshnikov. I mean, there are tons and tons of variations of the Sicilian defense where black plays a6. So a6 is not a bad move or a weird move in general in the middle game or, op or opening for black to, to throw out there. Um, as opposed to like, let's say, uh, Bezgadov's 2a3, that is a weird move. White doesn't always play a3 in the Sicilian. Uh, what else? <clears throat> There's, it, you don't even, it's not objectively that bad for black. Um, I think with, if both sides play absolutely perfectly, uh, white has an advantage that's less than half a pawn. So the fact that you have so much control over the opening and you still aren't going to get uh, a huge disadvantage is like, it's pretty nice. You know, because even in a lot of mainline openings uh, or even other series that we've looked at, uh, you, you would get a higher evaluation. Like, for example, even in the Benoni, you know, you could learn a ton of Benoni theory and still be, your opponent has more than half a pawn advantage. So the fact that the evaluation isn't that high is, is pretty advantageous, I would say. And also, here's the final point, is that it's good to play for a win. You're going to get, a, a, um, what's it called, an asymmetrical pawn structure. It's not going to be like, like, let's say you play the French defense you're, and they play the exchange variation, you're already groaning. Right, if you want to play for a win with black, that's a lot tougher. Or like a Petrov, or a lot of E4, E5 openings get symmetrical pawn structures. Or uh, even like something like a Karol Khan is not necessarily symmetrical pawn structure, but kind of tougher to win. So if you want to play for a win, you want not a lot of theory, and not even that bad objectively, then this is the opening for you. But there are some downsides, otherwise people would play a lot more often, right? Uh, <clears throat> with most hypermodern openings, and this is no exception, you're going to have less space. So if you don't like having a lot less space, then, uh, well, it's kind of tough. <laughs> kind of tough. It's tough to play hypermodern opening where you don't get a lot less space. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, probably you're going to have to play against an isolated queen pawn structure as black. Um, and also, your, your opponent can also get into a Marazzi bind. And we'll see what I'm talking about, obviously, when we analyze the variations a bit. So you're going to have to be comfortable with black playing against the isolated queen pawn and against a Marazzi bind, which, I mean, the isolated queen pawn, if you're a student of the game, that's probably one of, if not the first pawn structure you study. 
So you should be kind of familiar with it um, if you like to uh, study chess. Uh, but it's not for everyone. Not everybody likes to have a, a black and an ice against an isolated queen pawn. Some people do, like Karpov would. You know, Karpov loved to do that. But uh, other people, they wouldn't really like to play with less space and stuff like that. So that is one practical downside. If, if you're not into that, then that's, that's, you know, you're not going to enjoy that. Um, and finally, if your opponent plays, as we'll see on move three, they could play c4. <clears throat> that's almost forcing a con variation, in my opinion. I mean, unless black does some really weird stuff, black usually just goes into a con Sicilian, where uh, playing c4 early in a con is fine for, for white to do. I don't really think that that's a, 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 an objective problem for black. I think that black can still do well to equalize. And that'll be the third thing that we look at, and I didn't analyze it too much because, you know, to me it doesn't really fit in the scope of our studying, right? It, it's not really a con, actually. It's, or I'm not sorry, it's not really a, an, an O'Kelly. It, it's a con. So that's a little bit outside of our scope. But, yeah, you could say, like, well, why should I play the O'Kelly? I could just play the con, which, uh, yeah, there's an argument to be said for that. And you could even play both if you want. But, yeah, anyways, Taimanov, who is mostly known for the Taimanov Sicilian, played the con quite often. He had uh, over 20 games in the database, something like 25 games. Uh, so we'll take a look at most of them, uh, first of all. But, all right, let's, uh, let's dive on in here. The first game we're going to look at is against, uh, hmm, let me see, how do I pronounce this name? Uh, Ujtemen? I don't know. I don't know if he'd pronounce it like that. Ujtemen. Yeah, from 1970. Yeah, Taimanov played this mostly in the 60s and 70s uh, from an interzonal. So pretty serious event. And let's take a look. E4, C5. The first thing we're going to look at is when white plays with D4. If you read opening books, which, uh, well, it's a waste of time. No, no not really. But uh, it's, I think, you know, the least instructive chess book you can read is an opening book, really. Uh, but, but most opening books will tell you, if they look at something like this, that 3D4 might even be a mistake. Um, which, I don't know, I'm kind of on the fence about it. I think that if you study this for white, you shouldn't play d4. And if you have black, you really like to see d4. And that's another benefit of the O'Kelly variation is that if your opponent doesn't know what they're doing, they'll probably just play d4 here because that's what you normally do in an open Sicilian. And uh, it's not necessarily the best move. Uh, but like, like I said, a lot of people would just say it's a mistake. We'll take it, like normal. And knight f6. I think that knight f6 is the most accurate move order here. Although, uh, Taimanov did have some games with the move e5. One problem with playing e5 earlier, like he does here, is that, uh, well, I guess white doesn't really have to play knight c3 all the time. Like, for example, uh, there was this game that he played against Leonid Stein, who is a pretty nice attacking player. Stein went back to f3, which is an interesting move. And then he even played bishop c4. Yeah, he still end up, ended up defending the pawn, you know, because both the e-pawns are hanging, so if you take one, I'll take the other. He still ended up defending the pawn with knight c3, though. But after d6, the, the astute observer would notice that this is actually uh, sort of a mainline knight orf now. You just transposed into a knight orf. So I didn't analyze this any further because we're not studying the knight orf, are we? And anyways, I don't think you should play this move order with black. For the record, they drew the game, but it doesn't really matter for us. And yeah, you'll notice that a lot of the times a con can transpose to different uh, opening variations, like a knight orf. I'm sorry, the O'Kelly can transpose to other opening variations, like the knight orf and like the con. So that's something to think about when you're playing the O'Kelly. Um, there was also a game where Taimanov's opponent played knight b3, and then Taimanov did play knight f6, and here his opponent... Uh, eschewed for, for a moment the move knight c3 and played bishop g5, which I think is an interesting move. Because, you know, when you're playing e5 here, you weaken d5. So playing bishop g5 is strategically uh, correct, right? Maybe you'll take the knight, like what sort of happens here, and then d5 will be a weak square. And even though white gives up the bishop pair, uh, black is going to have some weak white squares. And the bishop is a dark square bishop, so we can't control the white squares with that bishop, can we? He still ended up playing knight c3 a little later, though. He didn't even have to, right? He could have you know, defended any other way. 
Yeah. This was the game Borislav Milic against uh, Taimanov from 1959. And uh, here, White played bishop c4, which is not the best move. It just sort of runs into b5. I was recommending, uh, or I looked with the computer, computer is recommending to play queen d6, which is a pretty irritating move to look at, right? I mean, it doesn't, that's not the move you really like to see if you have black, I think. The recommendation was rook e8 to go to e6. And knight d5, this is just a computer variation, not necessarily forced, but white was getting an advantage here, taking the bishop and just moving the queen back to a3. Kind of a funny square to see the queen on with the knight right next to it like that. Um, but yeah, the computer liked white here, and I'll have to agree, you know, it seems like a position's kind of weird for both sides. I mean, rook on e6 so early and the queen on a3 are both kind of weird, but black doesn't even have the bishop pair anymore and has a, a backwards d-pawn and doesn't really have much to show for it. I mean, he has the typical Sicilian thing that he has an extra center pawn, right? He's got a d-pawn instead of a c-pawn, but that's about it. So I think that white should definitely be a little bit better here, and I do like how safe the queen is on a3. Safe but active, controlling that dark square diagonal. And this also, by the way, it's, I guess it stops b5 because bishop takes b5, uh, pins the, you know, the, a, the a6 pawn's pinned. So, e5 at once, I was getting an advantage with white. I think it's smarter to play knight f6. This is guaranteeing, well, more or less guaranteeing that he's going to play knight c3. That's the best move. And uh, then we could play e5 after. So I think this is the proper move order. And here, Taimanov has faced uh, multiple moves. Uh, Ujtumin <laughs> played knight d e2, but let's talk about knight f3 first. Uh, Taimanov has had this position a few times. The first time he played this, he actually played d6, which again can transpose to a uh, to a knight orf, right? If if white plays a move like bishop e2 or even bishop e3 you transpose to a knight orf, uh, which again, we don't really want to do that anyway, so this is already a reason for us not to play this way. But I think that white can also play interesting moves like bishop g5. All right, bishop g5 can also be an interesting move. Again, we're trying to control that square. Just as an example, because this is a pretty important concept to understand, white trying to get in on that d5 square. We can look at a game that he played here, bishop c4, to d5. Here white played knight d2. That's actually a good maneuver generally to put the knight in on these white squares. However, it was a little bit mistimed here, <clears throat> as we'll see. White could have preferred a4 for the record, and probably white's better there. After knight d2, queen g5 is allowed because we removed the knight from f3. Which is kind of nice because now you know you don't want to castle because bishop h3 might be strong, or um, well I guess a queen f3 would would be the response then anyway. But he plays queen f3 here, bishop e6, good move, and already uh, already it's it's equalizing for um, uh, for black. I was just thinking if castles bishop h3 queen f3 the d2 knight would be loose. I just put that up there if just you know for posterity's sake. My point is that here the knight on d2 is loose, so we can even maybe do a tactic like this. You know, yeah, win a pawn. Although our b pawn's hanging, but okay, white has a lot of hanging pawns too. Or we could even maybe play bishop g4 there. But anyways, queen f3, bishop e6. Black was already doing well here, or at least equal in the game uh, Karak Logic <laughs> against Taimanov from 1953. Bishop takes b7 is what the guy played. I wouldn't recommend that. Black was already better here. Black's work is really good. White can't castle. Well, white can't castle kingside because it loses the knight and probably shouldn't castle queenside either. But yeah, like I said, uh, this is already good for black. Although they did end up drawing that game from 57. But yeah, I don't think that d6 is good for us in a practical sense anyway because if white wants, white can just transpose to a knight orf. So we should do what Taimanov did later in his career. He played bishop b4. 
That's the way to do it. And this is how we're differentiating our play from a knight orf. We didn't play d6 yet. In a knight orf, you would have already played d6, so our bishop can't be developed like this. Bishop c4, queen c7, bishop b3. I believe that uh, queen d3 is more common, although I didn't find a time and off game here. d6 castles takes, should take the knight when they castle, so it's not pinned anymore, so you might as well take it. And knight bd7. By the way, white should take with the queen so that, I mean, should not take with the queen because then uh, your e pawn would be hanging. So bishop, uh, bc rather, and knight bd7. But yeah, this position, it's a pretty interesting position. Uh, white's got the bishop pair, but obviously has a terrible pawn structure. Black also has a weak d pawn, um, but white, um, or black has a good setup against white's bishop pair. Right? He has the white square bishop, and he put his pawns on dark squares. And that's what you want when you're fighting against the bishop pair. You put your pawns in the opposite color of your bishop to control uh, the, the unopposed bishop that the opponent has. And yeah, it should be pretty equal. I would personally prefer black there, but maybe some people would like the bishop pair a lot. You know, I like bishop pair a lot. <laughs> bishop b3, this is a game that actually Geller played against Taimanov. Castles, and then he took, like I said, that's what you should do when they, uh, when they castle. And now uh, Taimanov got a little bit too aggressive here with knight takes e4, which, you know, you might think, oh, just take that free pawn, who cares, right? But for the record, d6 should equalize, similar to what we just looked at with queen d3, right? Similar to that. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't be getting greedy here. You shouldn't open up the position and get greedy like this when you're behind in development and the guy has two bishops. Rook e1, great move. Even uh, computer is saying d5 is kind of the only move here, which is kind of funny. We could just take it. But at least uh, black could try to get out the bishop and knight. Queen d2. In case you're wondering why didn't he play queen takes e5, I don't know. That's good. That's a good move. <laughs> he could totally have done that. But he played queen d2, which is also not bad, by the way. Rook d8. Bishop e6 is actually kind of forced. Uh, the problem is if you like make a normal developing move, we've got bishop b2 in, and then after you move your knight, we're taking here. I mean, these bishops are a menace, right? Like this is terrible. It's already lost. You're just going to have to take my word on that if you don't believe me, but you should believe me. <laughs> it looks terrible. So, bishop e6 um, is actually the only move. Takes, takes, queen g4. And here, Geller still has a pretty serious advantage. I mean, he's a pawn down, but you could hardly tell. Those doubled isolated e-pawns are, are goners, basically. And the bishop on, well, I was going to say b2, because that's where it's probably going to go. That's the best minor piece on the board by a mile. Um, it's only a, a testament to Taimanov's uh, defensive capabilities that he didn't lose, lose this. They ended up drawing in uh, 1958. Yeah, so, yeah, knight f3, bishop b4 is the answer, but, and we could do like Taimanov did, just don't, uh, don't, go, don't go pawn hunting, right? d6 is fine, and setting up, like we said, pawns on dark squares when we have our white square bishop and we can fight against the bishop pair. So, Ujtumin played knight de2. That's an interesting move. I think it's kind of the toughest move because um, what he's saying is, oh, sure, we have to move our knight around a lot, but we're trying to get in on these white squares. Come on, yeah, like that. See, e5 weakens the white squares, clearly. So white could try to maneuver the knights around into that. That's how you do it. Bishop c5, knight g3, and <clears throat> Taimanov's had this position a couple of times. Both times he's played queen b6, which is an interesting move. I don't think it's bad. The normal move is going to be d6, where I think, uh, yeah, it should be pretty equal. It, well, it's still early to say, but you should equalize it eventually. But we can look at queen b6. It's a sharp move. It's kind of a double-edged move. The idea is obviously you're attacking f2, right? So white's going to have to defend that with the queen. It's the only piece that really can seriously defend that. Um, the downside from black's perspective is that you're going to get forked 
which Timonov just allows that to happen. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about losing his dark square bishop, which it makes sense, as we've already talked about. So he's faced both, both queen d2 and queen f3 in this position. Uh, we'll look at queen f3 first, d6, where this actually threatens, uh, well, the idea is that you could try to play some bishop g4, not that that's even going to win material or anything, play knight d5, but uh, knight f5, knife f5 is what he played, his opponent here, takes, queen takes, knight c6. So already black has a pretty serious lead in development. Bishop d3, he didn't care to play uh, knight a4 because queen a5 check. Knight d4. Bishop d3, by the way, protects the c-pawn because knight d4 was going to be a double attack. Queen h3. And bishop b4, best move. And he took it and played knight e6. This is the game Ledic against Taimanov from 1970, where Taimanov did end up winning. And again, we're in a similar position where the opponent has the bishop pair, but uh, a bad structure. And I think that this is pretty comfortable for black. The knights have a lot of good squares. Uh, it's very easy to attack the doubled c-pawns. And, well, the dark square bishop's good for black, but the white square bishop is a not very good. I mean, the dark square bishop's good for white, obviously. But the white square bishop is not good for white. So that's kind of a problem. I would still take black here. Um, and yeah, like I said, Taimanov did end up winning, but he's probably stronger than Ledic anyway, so the result doesn't uh, say too much about the position. But it is winnable, at least. Definitely. Queen d2. This is what Ujtumin played. Castles. And yeah, like I said, he just let him fork. He's like, no big deal. Give me that. Take that dark square bishop. So here the difference is that uh, there, it, there aren't doubled pawns, right? There aren't doubled pawns for white. But white does have to spend some more time moving the queen and developing the dark square bishop. Both sides wasted some time moving the queen and knight around. So both sides wasted time there, and white's going to have to waste a little bit more time. C4, this is the computer recommendation. It stops D5 is the point. But it does weaken the dark squares. And anyways, black could still play a different pawn break, b5. Yeah, nice. Right. So here, probably the best move is d5, still. We broke down the, uh, we broke down the c pawn so we could play d5. And I think here that black should at least, uh, it'd be at least equal. It's true that, you know, you're opening up the position for the bishop pair, which you normally don't really love to do that. But black will have a lot of advantages to compensate for the bishop pair. And basically, after the E and D pawns get traded, black will have an E pawn for white's A pawn. I don't really have to tell you that an E pawn is usually better than an A pawn, at least in the middle game. So black will have a lot better control of the center because of that. And uh, black's rook on A8 is really... I mean, black is just really active. All of black's pieces are great. And black should be very satisfied with the outcome of the opening of this is the position you get from the O'Kelly variation. Um, instead, in this game, Taimanov actually played knight d4, which is a mistake, because Ujtumin played b4. Great move by Ujtumin. Great, if you, that's how you pronounce his name. Great move. The idea is just to develop the bishop to b2. In this way, white didn't lose any time to develop the bishop with the queen blocking it on d2. He got to play b4, bishop, b2, which is really nice. And again, this is allowed because of the move knight d4. The knight was controlling b4, so when you play knight d4, you allow b4, bishop, b2, and d6. So here black is a little bit worse. <clears throat> I even gave actually clearly worse, or clearly better for white. And uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because uh, black didn't really... I mean, black's not particularly active here. I guess the knight on d4 looks pretty good. But white still has the bishop pair and uh, is, in fact, in, ahead in development as opposed to the other variation. And still, he didn't have, a, he didn't have um, a weak pawn structure, although you, I guess you could say his A pawn is kind of weak. He'd rather have a D pawn than an A pawn, but uh, even still, it's, uh, it, it's better for white here to have the bishop pair. Although Taimanov did end up winning this game. Uh, again, you, you get a lot of chances to win in this, in this opening um, because it's so double-edged and you can positionally outplay your opponents. 
uh, quite often, even if you're worse. But yeah, we can uh, we, we can improve on his play. Like I said here, d5 is the move, is the move to equalize. But all right, that's all I had for this variation. Taimanov didn't face d4 very often on move three because it's not very good. So most people who knew what they were doing didn't play d4. Like, uh, although, like I said, Stein did, so it's kind of funny. But, well, I don't know. Maybe he, he thought it was okay. Or maybe he didn't know. <laughs> who knows? Hard to believe he wouldn't know. But all right, let's go on to the next one. Nah. All right, so yeah, this is going to be what I'd recommend you to play with white in case you're, uh, you know, an open Sicilian player and you're like, what do I do against uh, the O'Kelly variation, right? Uh, this is how I'd recommend you to play. On move three, we're going to play C3. Yeah, like I said, I think that's the best way to go. It, it makes a lot of sense for white to basically transpose to a C3 Sicilian, um, where A6 might not always be the most useful move. And this is where I was saying that if you play this with black, you'll probably have to play an isolated queen pawn's position. Uh, time and off plays the most common move here, d5. And I think that probably black is going to be very slightly worse here. Um, like I said, this is like the best way white can play, and it'll give a, a small advantage, a very small advantage for white with, with best play. Um, another option, I mean, black does have other options here. You might want to look at the move e6 if you don't mind to get a French-like position. Um, but e6 does have a downside that when you play the normal moves, you're in an advanced French where you've played a6 very early, which is not terrible because a lot of times black does play bishop d7 to b5, but if you, you could do this on your own. If you look at a French variation, uh, advanced variation, the proper move order, e4, e6, d4, d5, e5, c5, c3, nobody ever plays a6 right away. Like, nobody ever plays a6 right after that. Um, it's just, you know, might as well develop your pieces first, you know, do something like that. And you're also taking away some options, like you can't play b6, bishop, a6 anymore. So, yeah, I, I don't know, I think white should still be better here, and you have to sort of be okay with the French position which I feel like most people who play the Sicilian are, are not really keen on doing that. So I think d5 is the most logical way to go, even though, like I said, I think white gets a small advantage here. Takes, takes, d4. This is actually a game that I had, I had white against my grandpa, Ron Feingold, in a tournament in, in Michigan. Um, I for, kind of forgot how that game went. But I knew that a C3 was the best thing to do against the, the, the O'Kelly even then. Bishop E2. I don't know how many times I've said Khan instead of O'Kelly, but I mean O'Kelly. <laughs> trust me, I mean O'Kelly when I say Khan. Um, E6. Castles. And CD. There are actually... I cheated a bit here because there were a lot of games where he played Bishop E7 first and I didn't want to get the move order, I didn't want to muddy it up, so I just pretended like he played CD a lot. But there was one unique game where he played knight bd7, uh, c4, queen d6, knight c3. This is actually one benefit of playing CD right now, is that after you play c takes d, they can't play c4, assuming they play c takes as well. So that's why I kind of recommend to do it first. Let's look at this game though, c4, queen, d6, knight, c3. Normal looking moves. Knight takes. Yeah, you could even play queen takes, honestly. Even a position like this, white could be a little bit better. White doesn't mind to trade queens uh, because in, in the end game, he could have an advantage on the queen side. He has a three against two queen side majority, which is not a huge deal, but if, you're, if you ever have a queen side majority, you'd like it to be in an end game. That, that's the best time to have a queenside majority. So, well, this isn't exactly an endgame yet, in my opinion. Maybe you might argue that, but uh, even still, I think that trading queens isn't bad. Although knight takes wasn't bad either, for the record. Knight takes is fine, as was played in this time and off game. Castles and queen d2. This is a game Reinhardt Fuchs against Mark Taimanov. I don't know who Fuchs is. 
but they did end up drawing. But yeah, obviously, I think you could just look at this position and see that white is more comfortable, right? I mean, white's got a little bit more space. Uh, the bishop on c8 makes a sour impression, and it's even kind of difficult to get developed because if you play b6, they can play some bishop f3, which is a little bit annoying. And then c6 is a weak square uh, in this in that case. You know, just put that on the board in case you you're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, c6 would be a weak square in that case. So. It's a little bit tough for black, nothing that Taimanov couldn't handle. Again, even still, it's not like objectively lost or anything, um, but he ended up drawing in 1967 in that game. C takes. This is what he played against uh, Gipsless. Gipsless. Knight takes d4. I th that might be the best way to go. Uh, there are a couple of other variations that I looked at here. Queen takes, I think that's sort of the most toothless. Taimanov did face this once. He played knight c6. I don't think it's the best way to go. He should just go ahead and trade queens and play e5. And he's just got such easy development here. They look at those bishops. Even still, you might say, well, yeah, but white's got the three against two queenside majority. Yeah, that's true. You know, that's true. But uh, even still, black's going to be able to develop the pieces very easily. Black can also, uh, he has more center pawns, so that's kind of a, a plus that might compensate for it, especially because, like I said, just because the queens are traded, I don't really, wouldn't really say it's an end game yet. Um, so yeah, this should be pretty comfortable for black. Instead, he played knight c6, queen takes, knight takes, and this is a game he played against Bagirov. Bagirov's pretty good. Bagirov played... I don't understand what's going on here, <laughs> really. I, I kind of even wonder if it was a, uh, a like, error in notation. You know, I'm not even joking. Because uh, this was a serious tournament. This was a Soviet championship from 1960. And knight a3 was the move that Bagirov played. And that is not a great move at all. I mean, it loses a pawn for nothing, honestly. You could just take the knight, which... Taimanov didn't do. Taimanov played e5. He didn't take the knight. And e5 is obviously not good. You should take the knight, and then c3 is hanging after you take back. That's a free pawn, and I don't even see what the problem could possibly be here for black. You might say, well, maybe it's c4, but well, we could just retreat our bishop, and then we'll st we're still a pawn up here. Even if you win the pawn back, I'm not worse with black, right? Which you won't win the pawn back. So, I don't know what knight a3 was about. Like, does this seriously happen like this? I don't know. <laughs> it made me wonder about the notation. But yeah, a better move for the record in this position would be c4. And then uh, knight c3. Something more normal like this. Or I think that white could potentially be better here because the knight on b4 is not great. I mean, you could still take some time to maneuver it around, but black is behind in development, so you're going to have to waste a lot of time to get, uh, to get your pieces organized here. Even still, I think that, you know, black probably will equalize after, you know, like five or six more precise moves, something like that. But white should be more comfortable here and, and, and easier to play in general. In case you're wondering why bishop d2, there's just not a better square to get this bishop developed. Like bishop e3 gets forked. And bishop f5 doesn't make any or bishop f4 doesn't make much sense. Bishop g5, it's f6. And then bishop h6, obviously. So, yeah. But yeah, I think that, you know, white could potentially be a little better here. Um, but knight c6 was the culprit. If you just trade queens first and play e5, that should be very easy to equalize with black. It might not be the easiest to win with black. But what are you going to do? You can't win against everything so easily, can you? With black especially. So yeah, queen takes, like I said, pretty toothless. The most normal kind of move is going to be c takes d, I think. Which Taimanov faced several times. Bishop e7. Let's look at knight c6 first. A lot of times uh, Taimanov would not really play this move. He wants to play uh, knight bd7 to to b6 to d5. He would do that quite often. But he played knight c6 sometimes. I think he had at least two games here, if I remember. Yeah, he did. Because I remember the maneuver here, 
that white played was knight d2. Oh, sorry, I skipped ahead there. Pressed the wrong arrow. Haha, <laughs> hate it when that happens. Knight d2. Which, uh, that's an interesting maneuver. Uh, the idea is to play bishop f3. Uh, or knight c4. Or even knight e4, as was played one time. Taimanov faced this twice. Both times he played knight b4. And he's faced knight c4 and knight d e4. Knight d e4 is kind of uh, a little bit more timid. They traded. He just brought it all the way back and castled bishop f3. I mean, black's really happy to have traded off the set of knights, I think. Black could even play knight d5, and if you take it, it'll just be a completely symmetrical position there. Um, but actually, there, is, uh, there are no more moves to this game. They agreed to a draw in this position. This was a search Sirich against Taimanov from the Chagorin Memorial, 1961. Yeah, like I said, black equalized this pretty easily, and knight d5 was probably the best move. In a later game, he faced knight c4. I believe it was a later game. Yeah, it was. Knight c4, <clears throat> queen d8, and bishop f3. Knight db5. Knight bd5, I mean. Bishop g5. And queen b3. Queen b3 is not the only move, but I think it's it's logical enough. It's okay, at least. Rook b8, b5, and bishop b7. So Taimanov did get all of his pieces developed here, and he has a pretty comfortable looking isolated queen pawn position. I think he's fully equalized here. Um, although white could do something like taking on f6, then taking on d5, and both sides have an isolated queen pawn, potentially. Um, this was the game Gufeld against Taimanov from the Soviet Championship 1963, where Taimanov did end up losing it as black here, but definitely not because of the opening. He's, uh, he's totally fine here with black. He should be happy with how this middle game is playing out already. So yeah, like I said, you know, you're going to have to be used to playing an isolated queen pawn position if you play this way as black. Knight takes. This is what Gipsless, Gipsless played. Sometimes I just can't pronounce the names. I don't know what to tell you. Bishop e7. Yeah, Taimanov's played bishop e7 multiple times, and that's the normal move. But I will say that sort of a surprising move here, bishop d6, is <clears throat> the computer recommendation and should probably equalize. Uh, the idea is to get sort of a, a, a French Tarash kind of position where we play with queen and bishop battery here. And a6 is very useful in that case because uh, you can't fork me. So for example, bishop f3, which is a fine move. I mean, there were no examples of this, so I, had to, I was just making it up. Knight a3, I thought was a reasonable move. Again, not the only move. You can play bishop e3 here, but I'll play queen c7 anyway. So g3, this is stopping the battery that, that's gonna happen. You could also play with e5. Yes, this is a good move as well. e5, computer recommendation. Yeah, kind of a tricky line here. I just was looking at this for fun. Knight db5. The idea is that if you take it, I'll play bishop e3. Where your only queen move, yeah, the only legal queen move without hanging the queen is this one. But then you're, you're lost now. You lost a pawn, and you're going to lose back your minor piece on d6. And I'll have two bishops, and I'll have a lead in development, and I'll have the initiative. So, yeah, that wouldn't be great. But you can actually just back it up. If knight b5, you can just back it up. Turn around, back it up. Like this. <clears throat> Which, yeah, I think that white should still be a little bit better here. This is the best I could do with black. And I think that um, this is what I was talking about when I said earlier that uh, white should be a little bit better here. This is, I think, perfect play uh, for the O'Kelly variation, where both sides have played absolutely optimal, and uh, white should just be a little bit better. White's got the bishop pair for not much compensation. Uh, black does have an extra center pawn. You know, it's usually better to have an E pawn than a C pawn. Uh, but I still think that, uh, you know, I would take white here. It looks like a pretty comfortable two bishops, in my opinion. And it's not like the knight on a3 is very bad, in case you're wondering. There's, you know, he, he's, he's going to get back in the game without too much hassle. 
So this is, in case you're wondering how to play with white, this is how I would do it. Bishop e7. This is what he played, did Taimanov multiple times. Knight d2. <clears throat> this is what Gips Liss played, and I think it's the best move. That's why I kind of had him at, as the, uh, as the, the, the stem game. Ervis, I don't know if I said his name actually, Ervis Avars. A, A, A Avars Gipsless, tough name. Come on, buddy. Trying to teach chess here. Knight bd7. Uh, this is another game he had. Bishop e3. Knight bd7. This is different than the, the what Gipsless did. Knight d2. Queen d6. Bishop g5. Kind of funny to play bishop e3 then bishop g5, huh? Queen c2. Uh, this was against Geller, I think. Yeah, here you should probably just play queen c7. It's probably about equal then. Uh, but he went for a little trick. Knight g4. Threatening mate. Maybe he won't see it, right? Obviously he did. He took, and then you get to trade. So now actually, surprise, it's black who has the bishop pair, but just for one move, because you get forked. And give me that give me that bishop pair back. Bishop f3, e5. This is the game Geller against Taimanov from another Soviet championship, 66 to 67? Dang, a long championship back then. <laughs> Um, they did end up drawing, but <clears throat> I think that black still got some work to do to equalize here. You know, I gave that white was slightly better because black still is behind in development and uh, white is just ready to go, ready to get it, ready to get it on. And black still gonna, is going to need at least two or three moves to get his queen side fully, uh, fully in the game. So, you know, probably knight f5 is a good move here. I don't know if he played that, but even still, yeah, knight f5 to d6 is like a, a pretty strong idea. So I didn't really think the time enough fully equalized here. But like I said, you could play, uh, instead of knight g4, you could play queen c7. Uh, that, that was the computer recommendation, and, and it should probably equalize uh, after you play b5, bishop b7. Though still you have to worry about bishop f3, but you could play rook b8 first, you know. Try to avoid that with some rook b8 action. Okay, so Gipsless played knight d2. I think that's a stronger move. As we saw, bishop e3 was later moved to g5 anyway, so it's kind of a waste of a tempo. Yeah, knight d2 to c4. <clears throat> Strong play here. Queen d8. Bishop f4. Really great play by white. You know, really great play by white. Knight d5. Bishop g3. b5. Normal looking moves, right? You wouldn't really uh, question any of these moves. Here, white should have played with a4 all the time. White sort of held back on a4, but a4 is a really good move here. He didn't play it, like I said, but a4 is like a really strong move. If you play b4, queen b3 is strong, pinning the b-pawn and, and putting a lot of pressure on the queen side. Also, the queen is good on b3. Um, it gets out of the way of rooks going to, to d1 and even puts a little pressure on d5, which is kind of a key square right now. Instead of a4, he played bishop f3, which is not a terrible move. It looks pretty good. Queen c8 to get out of the pin there, protect his bishop, uh, so the knight on d5 is not pinned. Rook e1. Again, a4 just is, is really called for. <clears throat> for example, it wants to take and play knight b6 here, gain a tempo. And uh, yeah, it's tough for black because black's behind in development. And also, trading the A-pawn for the B-pawn is obviously good for white, because white you know, got the rook active on the A-file, and, and losing the B-pawn means that you don't control C4 as well. So you lost a little bit control of, uh, of part of the center there. So white should still be a little bit better here, but A4 is definitely the way to go uh, all the time. You should have played A4 last move, should play it here. A4 is the, the move. Create some tension in the position, because black's not fully developed. Black doesn't want there to be problems in the position uh, un until he gets his knight out, right? So, so that's how he should have done it. But he just improved with rookie one, which gave away all, basically all of his advantage uh, for now. But uh, for the record, Gipsless did still end up winning this game, even though he played a little inaccurately the last two moves. It's still kind of tough for Black. Like I said, the C3 variation is not exactly a walk in the park for Black. You got to know what you're doing. That that variation with bishop d6 is the best way to go. 
here on move eight. <clears throat> and bishop d6 is not a very normal move. Bishop d6 is definitely a, uh, like you usually play bishop e7. You know, you, that, that's what you would normally want to do anyway. But uh, with some fancy maneuvers, we can actually, uh, like we were saying, get it to potentially a, you know, like I said, this reminded me of a French, uh, a Tarash French defense, personally. But um, yeah, it's pretty close to equal. Even still, I thought white was a little bit better, though. So if you're playing, uh, if you're playing this as black, this is definitely something that you have to work on to make sure that you can survive into the middle game. But uh, it's not the worst, you know, ever, right? I mean, we looked at a lot of that, that Benoni stuff. I would play the Benoni, and, and it gave a much higher evaluation than, than this. So definitely uh, nothing to lose a lot of sleep over. But all right, that's all I had for C3. Um, I'm just checking because I thought, I thought there was a game against like, yeah, did we look at that game? No, no, see, I knew I missed something, right? I was thinking there was a game against Alexei Swayton, and we, I never mentioned him. So I'm like, why didn't I find that game? It's because here I only looked at knight c6. I didn't look at bishop e7, right? I didn't look at bishop e7. I knew I skipped something. I was like, where's that Swayton game? Yeah, here he, he's played knight c6 and bishop e7. They're pretty similar, so I got a little confused there. But let's take some time to look at bishop e7 here then. I'm glad I caught that. Yeah, bishop e3, yes, yes. Very good, yes. I'm happy I found that. Knight c3, queen d6, rook c1. There also he faced bishop g5 here. Again, we see bishop e3, then bishop g5. I didn't really think this is the best way to play. As you'll see, black gets a very comfortable position here. Just plays queen d5 and bishop b7. I mean, if black gets this setup, this is what, we've seen this before. This is what you want. This is the setup that you want with black. You got out all your pieces. You're controlling d5. That's the, the key square for an isolated queen pawn. And, uh, and it should just be equal. And Taimanov even beat his opponent here, Matulovic, uh, from 1965. Rook c1. This is what Swayton played. Knight bd7. Knight b6. Yeah, he could actually equalize here with queen b8. Really weird move. Yeah, see, I, I knew I remembered queen b8 too, and I'm like, why didn't I talk about queen b8? Yeah, queen b8, really weird move, but the idea is that you can meet bishop f4 with bishop d6. And uh, that actually isn't a big problem. I don't think bishop f4 is the best move there. But that's the problem with, like, knight b6. Well, he had to just go back to d8. Obviously, Taimanov saw that coming. That's why he played knight b6. But he's a little uncomfortable here. Yeah, this was his game against Swayton. Where he's, he's a little worse here. I mean, you could look at this and see it's kind of a bad version of an isolated queen pawn from black's perspective. White's got normal pieces everywhere, but black's a little bit passive on the queen side, right? The bishop on d7 is not great, and he didn't get in b5. He doesn't have counterplay. It's just like a slightly worse version of an isolated queen pawn. Even still, it's not terrible. It's definitely very far from losing. And with best play, it should definitely still be a draw, although he did end up losing, but Swayton's no joke, so, you know, you don't, uh, he's the type of guy, if you forget his variation, you remember, you're like, wait, I thought Swayton was in here, you know, there's a reason for that, because Swayton's uh, pretty strong, and he did end up beating Taimanov in, uh, in 1967 from this position. So, luckily, I caught that, so we finished up everything about the c3 variation <laughs> but yeah this is the toughest for black and you're going to have to play accurately like i said move eight bishop uh bishop d6 is the way to go if they play knight takes and uh yeah c takes we we can still um maybe even knight c6 is a better way to equalize than bishop e7 because i think i was equalizing there yeah I, i'm just looking through the notes it was it just c equals everywhere so <laughs> definitely definitely that's the way to go but all right let's uh continue on to the last thing I wanted to look at, which this won't take very long because we're, luckily, because we're a little short on time here. Uh, I just wanted to mention in, in case you, you might, maybe you have white and, and you like to play Marazzi bind. You could totally do this. <clears throat> you can totally do this here by playing uh, C4. Yeah, if, if you love the Marazzi bind, you could play C4 here, go for it, you know, with white. 
it, it's, it's all you. And this is one problem uh, for, for black, is that you basically have to transpose to a con. I mentioned this earlier, e6, knight c3, queen c7. This is the best way for black to play. Uh, bishop e2. There are, he, Taimanov had also different move orders here, like d4, knight f6. He, he had this position in 1966. And this is a direct transposition into the con. I even gave the proper con move order here. e6, d4, takes, takes, a6, c4. It used to be that people didn't play c4, though, actually. c4 is kind of, uh, well, I mean, people would play it, but it wasn't considered like a main line like bishop d3 and knight c3 were considered the main, main lines. But c4 is a good move. And then this is the position we just looked at. Also, Taimanov had this uh, in an O'Kelly variation move order with, uh, where white played a3 early. Which, by the way, that's the most common move in this position is a3, for the record. Not forced or anything. But he had a like this move order where the guy played a3. Knight f6, d4. Takes, takes. So he, again, trans, direct transposition from O'Kelly to the con. Um, bishop e2. This is a game he played against Anatoly Lane. He played bishop e2. Knight c6. Uh, he also had this position and played knight f6, which um, actually shouldn't be too different, but the way this game went, the guy played a3 here. And this allowed an interesting option. Taimanov played knight d4. See, now you're not getting into uh, a con. You know, now you're just in some weird position, right? He could have played d4 last move. Like this. Maybe he, because he didn't play a3 yet, he was afraid of takes and bishop b4. But he shouldn't be that concerned about it because with the knight on c6, uh, there's a little bit less pressure here than there would be um, in, in the normal con variation because he's already played knight c6. In fact, computer really liked the move bishop g5, which is kind of an unusual move, I would say. Um, there are a lot of like little tactics here, like bishop c3, bishop f6, bishop b2. You know, you got to calculate those variations. But computer liked white all the way through here. Which is, is a little bit, a uh, little bit weird variation. A3, knight, d4. Yeah, this, oh, I did the thing again where I pressed the wrong button. A3, knight, d4, h3. Yeah, h3 is okay. Bishop, e7, d3. Yeah, I mean, it's not like white uh, should be too proud of this position, right? Like, what has he got going on? This is Samoyliev, 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 that's how I, yeah, Samoyliev against Taimanov from the uh, 1957 Soviet championship where uh, they did end up drawing, actually. But yeah, I think Black should, should be pretty happy here, certainly with the bishop pair for basically nothing. I mean, he has a little less space, but it's okay, it's hardly... Hardly anything here. So he played knight c6 against lane. d4, lane went for it. And lane played a3 here, but I think, again, with the knight already on c6, um, that a3 is not necessary. It's not even necessary in the, in the, the con move order um, to play a3, like I said when uh, to stop bishop b4. That's not strictly necessary, but especially when they block their queen and, and they have less pressure here on the queen side on the c-file. I would probably just castle, and probably white got the better of the, of the move order there. But um, Layton did play a3. Even still, probably white's a little bit better here. Like this. You know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a Marazzi bind. Like, it, it, a computer always says white's better in like these Marazzi binds unless uh, black's got like something really good going on. But I think it overrates the position a little bit. And much like a King's Indian defense, uh, computer likes to have a lot of space and doesn't see a lot of counterplay for, for black. But black's potential, uh, dynamic potential, should not be underestimated in this pawn structure. You know, it's like a hedgehog pawn structure. And you should definitely not think that uh, just because the computer says white's better here that it's necessarily true, honestly. It just it loves to have more space 
and, and it's underestimating the fact that black can eventually try to play b5 and break with b5 or d5 and stuff like that. I think that, uh, that definitely black should be okay with this situation. Um, but this is a practical problem for black because, you know, you have to know a lot about an isolated queen pawn structure and a Marazzi bind structure, which are very different pawn structures. Uh, but that's the problem with playing a6 on move two is that it doesn't define a lot in the center, right? The opponent has a lot of options because you're just moving your side pawn. So, yeah, I mean, but okay, you get to control the opening on move two, like you're saying I'm playing the O'Kelly variation and uh, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> you know, suck it. <laughs> you know, you have to play the O'Kelly. But still, I think that white should definitely be playing c3 on move three. In my opinion, that was very difficult to even uh, get just a slightly worse position as black, although I think I achieved it with that eight bishop d6 variation. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting Taimanov played this a lot, even against strong players like Swayton and, and Anatoly Lane. I mean, those guys were bruisers, and he played it in serious tournaments. Geller, too, we saw. He played it in, in Gufeld. I mean, he played it in, in Soviet championships. Like, a lot of these games were from the Soviet championship. So obviously he believed that the opening, uh, the opening was playable. And, uh, oh, look, we got a, a late entry here. Yeah, probably I just won't admit them because, <laughs> you know, it's only four minutes left. Um, I was just going to wrap it up anyway, actually. Yeah, in fact, anyways, that's all I have for you today. If you enjoyed, please consider to leave a like or subscribe to the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta's YouTube. Thanks. Bye-bye.